Good evening. I'm Ivan Diamond. I'm a radiologist at Trillium Health Partners. I'm also co-chair of UJA's healthcare division for the 2020 campaign. I want to welcome and thank you all for joining us this evening for the next edition of UJA's Now You Know speaker series. Before I turn it over to our speakers, I'd like to thank our sponsor for tonight's webinar, Scotiabank. I would like to note that the session is being recorded and will be emailed to all of you tomorrow and will also be available on jewishtoronto.com. Please feel free to write questions to the panelists in the chat function. We've had a number of questions already submitted. If we have time, we will try and address some of the questions on the chat. Again, thank you for joining us this evening. Now please join me in welcoming our panel. I will turn it over to each of you to introduce yourselves starting with Dale Abrams, president of Abrams Financial. Thank you, Ivan. Uh, just to give you a quick introduction, so my name's Dale Abrams. I'm the president of Abrams Financial. We started our company about 10 years ago, uh, exclusively focused to working with physicians and dentists across Canada. The areas of our specialty are in the areas of insurance, investments, and tax advisory solutions and we're currently providing financial security to about over 1,100 uh, doctors and dentists across the country. Thank you, Dale. Next, Justin Abrams, partner at Kraft Burger LLP. Thanks, uh, thanks, Ivan. Um, hope all is well, everybody. Uh, my name is Justin Abrams, tax partner at Kraft Burger LLP. Um, it's a, a mid-sized accounting firm uh, based in uh, based in Toronto, and uh, mostly um, large, you know, high net worth uh, individuals, owner-managed businesses with a large, large focus on uh, physicians, dentists, and other healthcare practitioners. Um, so the topics that we're going to touch upon tonight are stuff that we deal with on a day-to-day -day basis. Thanks, Justin. Last but certainly not least, Kate Bresner, who is an associate at. Littler specializing in labor and employment law solutions. Hi everybody, I'm Kate. I'm an associate lawyer with Littler LLP. Littler's an international law firm that specializes only in labor and employment law. So we help employers out with all kinds of employment issues across different industries from hiring to firing, everything in between and everything that comes up thereafter. Okay, so, so, so thank you, Kate. So we, we've had a number of questions and what we've tried to do is uh, group those that we've received into themes. So what I wanna do uh, this evening is a number of the questions centered around insurance. And I thought I would start by asking Dale some of these questions. So Dale, so the first question is, as a healthcare professional, how has COVID-19 affected my insurability? Thanks, Ivan. Uh, that's a great question. And it's something that we've been uh, dealing with almost every day the last, uh, 16 weeks or so, how long COVID's been going on. Um, so one of these areas of risk management, we're talking about kind of life insurance, disability and critical illness insurance, kind of the, the planning insurance vehicles. And there's a huge misconception as far as uh, someone having COVID-19 or being in contact with that and that they're completely uh, uninsurable or illegible for it. And so one of the biggest things I'll say is, you know, being a healthcare professional, and being on the front lines, that's, all, that's obviously something that uh, is at the forefront here. And so if, if there's been no, if someone has not been diagnosed positive with COVID-19, then they are insurable and they can apply for insurance. If someone has been tested positive with COVID-19 or has recently traveled outside of Canada in the last 30 days, then what we're gonna recommend is that they would postpone any application that they're considering either A, wait the 30 days till they've now been in Canada with no symptoms, or if they have had symptoms of COVID, that they wait until those symptoms have resolved themselves, <coughs> that they're completely healthy to, to move forward. So the biggest misconception is that uh, it kind of, you're disqualified for six months or a year, or you can't apply for anything, that's not true. It's just really for that period of time when you've tested positive and you have the symptoms. Okay, so, so great, thank you. So. So Dale, what does the elimination period mean on my insurance policies? And how can I receive income or benefit from my disability or overhead insurance during the COVID-19 pandemic? 
That's a great question. So just to give a refresher, the elimination period is otherwise known as the waiting period on a disability insurance policy. And so if someone, if, if a health care professional for whatever reason, act, uh, injury or illness can't go to work, they usually have to satisfy that elimination period. Now that period can range from 14 days to 720 days. Most disability policies are going to be designed with a 90 day waiting period. And a lot of people will have business overhead policies as well. So if something's happened, we're now due to injury or illness, you can't go to work as early as 14 days, you can now claim those benefits. The really important thing to understand as it relates to COVID is people want to know when does that elimination period technically start? As soon as you experience symptoms, then that is the beginning of satisfying the elimination period when it starts. You don't have to wait until you have tested positive. Okay, so, so Dale, um, if, if a healthcare professional is struggling to pay their insurance premiums due to COVID, are there any relief options available to them? Yes, there most definitely are. Um, and so what's nice to see is that it started with one or two insurance companies at the beginning of COVID. It has now really grown to almost all the insurance companies where they are providing relief measures. Anyone who's had any impact whatsoever, big or small, they can get a deferral of their, of their monthly payments by up to three months, 90 days. So that's one option. Another option that some companies are offering is, for example, with life insurance, people can actually request to reduce their benefits up to 50%, so to lower the cost for a period of time. And then 90 days later, they'll let them re-increase that face amount, that benefit, with no medical questions. And another thing that um, a lot of healthcare professionals have been using as an outlet uh, for an emergency fund as a short-term solution is many professionals have whole life insurance policies, permanent insurance policies that have cash value. And that's something that can be accessed within 48 hours. So if someone is struggling for cash and over, the, over a period of the last 5, 10, 20 years, they've built up these cash values in their insurance policies, they can borrow against that to to fund a temporary solution for them. What, what, are the, what are the tax implications in general of borrowing against an insurance policy, if there are any? So I'll speak to that on a high level because it's kind of, you know, depending on the structure of the policy, whether it's owned personally or corporately and how it's borrowed. But uh, speaking personally, you know, someone who's, who's, who's borrowing against their personal policy and doing a policy loan, there's no real tax implications for that, depending on what they're, um, and Justin can speak to this a little bit because he's, he's the tax expert, but as far as uh, depending on what their adjusted cost base on their policy is and their cash value, there may be a slight disposition, but for the most part, there should be no issue being able to borrow that money and then pay that back within a 12 month period. And, and Justin, if, it's, if the policy is owned by a corporation, Muted. <laughs> Somebody muted me before. So if the policy is owned by a corporation, they're, um, okay, on a, high, on a very high level, essentially, because it, if you, the individual, are pledging a corporate asset, namely the insurance, uh, the conventional sort of thinking was that, you know, because you're using something of the corporation, you have to pay uh, what we call a guarantee fee or some sort of fee to the corporation for the right to personally to personally pledge that asset i.e the insurance because it doesn't belong to you it belongs to the company so uh there's kind of mixed uh, feelings on this but generally speaking if you pay a reasonable guarantee fee uh to the corporation for the use of that asset you can you know subject to some very technical uh, rules which the cra has favorably commented on you should be able to borrow personally against that corporately owned insurance policy. Okay, so I just want to uh, remind participants that if you have any questions, uh, feel, feel, please feel free to use uh, the, the, the chat function. You can either message all panelists or, or, or message me, me directly. Um, I'd like to switch gears and I want to talk about some of the COVID programs that the government's offering. 
Um, I know there's a bunch of them. I can't keep track of all of these <laughs> acronyms. And I'm hoping that uh, Justin can walk us through some of the programs that could be available to healthcare professionals and who would be qualified and when one when would one to use those programs. Uh, sorry, I was muted again there. Um, uh, so, so basically, there are four, there are five main programs, uh, but one we're not going to talk about because that's really not for, for business owners per se. It, it, sorry, I should say it's not really uh, prevalent within the healthcare community. So much depending on, of course, what you do, but if we're talking about uh, physicians and, 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 and primarily physicians and dentists, then it's, it's mostly going to be the Canadian, the wage subsidy, the 75% wage subsidy, the temporary wage subsidy, uh, and the $40,000 loan, and then the commercial rent assistance. So we'll go through all of those in due course. The CERB, which is the 2000 a month that everybody is referring to, we can get into that, but I, I, it's not business specific. I would rather focus on the other four um, because, you know, there's, there's a lot to discuss here. So there's a ton of acronyms that are being thrown around there. So the SUS, CEWS, the Canada Emergency Wage Subsidy. What this is, is basically a, a program by the government to help employers, okay, uh, corporations and individuals, partnerships, charities. It could be almost anything um, to cover the wages of their employees. So for healthcare professionals, you might be asking, well, you know, I don't have any employees, you know, I'm the only employee. That's fine. Uh, you don't have to have, you know, 10 employees to qualify for this. All in a nutshell, you really needed for this, let's call it the 75% subsidy, okay, the SUS, was uh, basically a decline in, uh, if we're looking at the month of March, a decline of 15% uh, compared, if you compare March 2020, to the previous March, or you can compare March 2020 to the average of Jan Feb. So there's all these different formulas, but you basically will take the month in 2020 from when COVID started, so call it March. If you saw a decline in 15%, that's how you determine if you qualify for March. If you qualified for March, you automatically qualify for the next period. And we'll get into what the benefits of qualification mean. Starting in April and May and June and July, they, they, they extended this all the way to the end of August, you have to see a 30% revenue, revenue decline. And um, that's again measured, you can choose the method, but you have to be consistent once you choose the method. So if you're looking at a 30% revenue decline in April compared to the previous April, okay, then you have to stick with May to May, June to June, etc. So once you qualify for this, the government will basically top up uh, salaries that you pay up to a maximum of, of, call it $850 a week. It's not exactly a 50, but it's around that amount. So, you know, if you're paying millions of dollars in salary to one person, uh, you, you, you can't get covered for that. There's sort of a cap. Uh, if you think of 60,000 annual of salary, that breaks down to about the cap that the 75% wage subsidy will pay you. Uh, that is a taxable subsidy. Okay, so it means you will have to pay tax on it at the end of the year. So that's something that people often do forget. So, um, but it is still a great, great incentive. And it did help a lot of employers keep their employees employed. The good thing is, if you didn't know about this, or you haven't applied yet, you have until October 1st to apply. So if you didn't apply, it's not too late. Um, there have been a ton of applications and you can do it through the government's website uh, or if you have a My Business account, okay, those are the two ways to do it. And the money is given to you relatively quickly. There are strict fines, uh, jail time, making your name public, kind of a scarlet letter type of approach. Uh, if you try to game the system, not saying anybody here would, but there are, have already been claims a fraudulent activity with respect to this. And I think Justin Trudeau today came out and, and made some supporting statements around that, uh, around that regard. So they will be audited. Uh, so if you're going to apply, you want to make sure that you have really tight records in comparing uh, that revenue from 2020 to 2019 or the average of Jan Feb. So make sure you work in conjunction with your accountant for that. 
That's for the 75% wage subsidy. Um, just for the sake of time, I just want to talk about the others. The temporary wage subsidy is a uh, wage subsidy that's automatic. You don't have to apply. All it is is basically per employee that you pay wages to. It's a maximum benefit of $1,375 per employee. And all you do is as you're paying salary, you just withhold, you keep back some of the withholdings you would otherwise send to the government and you put that in your pocket. Okay, so there's no application process for that. It's just done. The SIBA, so the, um, the, can, the Canada Emergency Business Account, it's hard keeping track of all the acronyms, but this, this is given out about $24 billion of credit. And what this is, um, it initially came out and it only applied to those with a payroll account that had payroll between 50,000 and 1.5 million. People came out and said, well, that's not fair. What if I pay myself dividends or I didn't even take a salary? Okay. So the government came and said, we'll reduce it to 20,000. They said, that's not good enough. So now it is basically open to anybody who has a business operating account, uh, has a CRA business number and has filed a 2018 uh, or 2019 tax return. And here's the main criteria. All you need are non, what they call it, eligible non-deferrable expenses of at least 40,000. So what's an eligible non-deferrable expenses? Well, rent, property taxes, utilities, insurance. As long as you think you have that, apply for this. They are giving you the money. This is an application through your bank, not the federal government. You're getting the money the next day. So um, the application forms have not caught up to the legislation. So they're still asking incorrect questions. So if you're a doctor or a dentist or health healthcare professional, and you're saying, well, I didn't pay myself any salary, the form still asks the wrong question. You will have to tell your lender, hey, this is an old form. I didn't pay myself any salary. Don't ask me for it. Uh, I still qualify. So that's the Canada Emergency Business Account. The last one, uh, I'm just going to speak on really quickly because it's probably not as germane or pertinent as the other ones, but it's um, the, the commercial, uh, Canada Emergency Commercial Rent Assistance. And this is, you know, if you're paying rent, this is for the landlords, okay? This is not for the tenants. So it, it might not apply to too many people. That's why I'm not going to spend too much time on it. But it basically gives the landlord the ability to, uh, if they cut your rent by 75% or more, basically get subsidized for that and they'll only be out of pocket 25%. So those are really the main uh, COVID related uh, benefits, uh, especially the first three that would be very pertinent to healthcare professionals. So, so, so Justin, so a healthcare professional would need to be incorporated. So an unincorporated physician would not be eligible for any of these. No, as I mentioned, sorry, uh, maybe I, I, I glossed over that, but, you do not need to be incorporated. Um, you just need, for example, for the SUS, the 75% one, you can be a sole proprietor, um, but you need to pay wages, right? You need to pay wages in that case. So, um, you know, unless you have an employee in that case, you wouldn't, you wouldn't qualify. Um, so, you know, you do not need to be a, a corporation for any of these. You can be a, a sole proprietor. Okay, okay. Th th thank you. Um, so, Kate, we've had a number of questions around, surrounding employee safety and employee rights working in healthcare professionals' offices and doctors and dentists' offices. I wonder if you could speak to some of these. So we had a question is, can an employee refuse to work as a consequence of the COVID pandemic? Well, so this engages uh, Ontario's occupational health and safety legislation. And so under that legislation, employees do have a right to refuse unsafe work. However, I think it's important to know that that work refusal right doesn't apply to all employees. There's exceptions in two circumstances. So one, when danger is inherent in their work or a normal condition of their employment. So corrections officers, or in situations where the refusal to work would directly endanger the life, health, or safety of another person. So I think this is really important for all of us here in some circumstances, depending on 
um, the healthcare setting that everybody works in, but persons employed in the operation of the hospital in long-term care homes, mental health centers, ambulance services, certain laboratories are exempt as well. Um, and as well, laundry, food service, power plant, technical services and facilities that are used in conjunction with those healthcare facilities, those workers may also fall into that exemption category where you don't have a right to refuse um, work that's potentially unsafe. But if we're going to just assume that none of our employees are exempt and we're working in maybe a, a family health clinic, a, a regular dental office, um, and our workers don't fall into those exemptions. Employees can refuse unsafe work so long as that refusal is reasonable. So three things we would generally consider when we're assessing if something is reasonable in this circumstance and specifically with COVID-19. So a general fear of COVID-19 and fear of being maybe out in the public and exposed to it and just not wanting to leave your home, that's usually not going to meet the threshold of being a reasonable um, reason to not come into work. Um, but then we want to consider other vulnerabilities as well. So does that individual have underlying health conditions that would make them more hesitant to go into the workplace? Is the um, are they older? Are they in the age category where they're going to be more vulnerable? Um, does the workplace itself have anything where we could say, you know, that, that employees might be exposed to COVID more often? Um, maybe not so much in a, in a regular family clinic, like we're thinking more on the COVID floor of the hospital or something like that where you're exposed to it all the time. Um, so we have to play with all these different ideas um, and different factors. Health and safety too is important, especially from the employer's standpoint. If the employer is doing their due diligence and meeting their health and safety obligations and um, has implemented all the precautions that they need to to make sure the workplace is as safe as it possibly can be in these circumstances, um, the employees are going to have a harder time showing that it's reasonable for them to refuse to come to work. So, so, so Kate, what, what, what would the sort of bare minimum safety precautions be in order to, to, to meet the requirements? Well, let's talk about the requirements first. <laughs> so, um, under general occupational health and safety, the, the legislation, employers, employees, managers, supervisors, everybody has a whole slew of duties and responsibilities that they are supposed to, they're obligated to meet all the time. So forget about COVID, just all the time, a normal day, we're supposed to be meeting these health and safety obligations. So a few key ones I'm going to just point out. So one, employers have a duty to take every precaution reasonable in the circumstances to protect their workers. Two, employers are obligated to provide information, instruction, and supervision to their workers to protect their health and safety as well. Ensuring equipment, materials, protective devices, that all of that is, you have all the equipment that you need. First of all, all of it is in good working order and it's safe and employees know how to use it and they've been trained in how to use it. You have to post copies of the Occupational Health and Safety Act in the workplace. Ministry of Labor poster outlining the, the nuts and bolts of um, occupational health and safety needs to be posted. You have to develop a health and safety program and policy and then post that in the workplace. You have to train your workers on that program and policy and that health and safety awareness in general. As well, depending on the size of your workplace, so I'm not sure how applicable these will be, but for workplaces with five to 19 employees, you need a health and safety representative who um, you're going to rely on to help improve health and safety conditions in the workplace and also help you with things like developing plans and protocols for COVID specifically. Um, if your workplace is 20 plus employees, then you need a committee. So same idea, just more people are gonna be involved in that process. So with COVID-19, specifically what precautions do you have to take? Some healthcare settings may already have certain um, mandatory procedures or protocols that have to be followed. Um, so I'm gonna just speak more generally to um, 
a workplace where we, you know, we're just basing it off of occupational health and safety requirements instead of um, something mandatory that's very specific to a specific kind of workplace, like a long-term care home, for example. Um, so there's five things I would say in summary that employers should be doing to meet their health and safety requirements even before they reopen the workplace. So first is conducting a risk hazard, a risk and hazard assessment. Um, so that's something you can do with your health and safety representative or health and safety committee. You can hire professionals who will come in and do that kind of assessment for you. Um, and part of that assessment, the whole point of it is to number two, determine what protocols and procedures and measures need to be put in place before workers can come back to the workplace and before it's safe. Three, develop a written plan and protocol. So the government of Ontario has been calling these the infectious disease preparedness and uh, preparedness and response plan. Um, so you can call it whatever you like, the COVID safety plan, whatever you want, but um, having a written plan in place will help you to make sure that it's followed. It's easier to train employees and it's easier to educate your patients, educate the public, anybody who's coming into your office to know how things are going to go and, and what measures are in place to protect them and to protect your workers. So number four, implementing engineering controls and administrative controls in the office before anybody comes to work. So when we say engineering controls, that means things like installing um, hand sanitizer units, installing plexiglass shields um, in the, at, at the reception desk so there's no interaction between your receptionist and patients who are coming in, for example. Um, so those kinds of things are, are engineering controls as well. Checking your ventilation system. Is it all working properly? If you're working with specialized equipment like aerosols and dentistry, you want to make sure that all that equipment is working properly. Um, and then administrative controls are, are things like more managing your people. So can we institute, uh, you know, different scheduling of shifts so that certain employees, like we don't have a lot of employees all at the office at the same time so that we can maintain two meters of distance in the office at all times. Can we accommodate somebody who has to take public transit to come into the office to come in at maybe not at rush hour so they're not on a crowded bus? Um, things like that. So th these are what we have to be thinking about before the office even opens. Finally, number five, <laughs> inform and train employees um, on these protocols and procedures and make sure that they follow them and know what they're doing. Um, there are so many different options <laughs> about what we can implement in the workplace and it will very much depend on what our workplace looks like and how many people work there and all these other details. So Government of Ontario has specific guidelines for dental offices for physicians and primary uh, care providers. So you can take a look at those for some ideas of what to do as well. The Royal College of Dental Surgeons of Ontario has a great and very comprehensive guide um, outlining the different precautions that dentists should be taking. Um, so, and you know, there, it really, it really de depends on your office what you're going to implement um, and whether you're going to implement screening protocols and things like that before people uh, come into the office every day if you want to. But. Well, th th thank you. So, so Kate, um, one more question, and that is that my employees are returning to work from a layoff or leave during which time they receive reduced or no pay. What is my liability to these employees when they return to work? Well, this is a fun question because the answer is really summarized as a, a question mark um, because the law has changed quite a bit in light of COVID. Um, generally speaking, under normal circumstances, when we have a substantial change to a fundamental term of employment, so something like a big salary drop or elimination of your salary, um, reduction of hours, elimination of hours, this may constitute what's called a constructive dismissal, where essentially you've been terminated because the, the terms of your employment have, have changed so substantially and, and you didn't agree to it. Um, but so on May 28th, so just moments ago, <laughs> the government of Ontario instituted 
new legislation essentially saying under the statute, reduction of salary, reduction of hours of work, that doesn't constitute a constructive dismissal as far as the statute is concerned. It doesn't constitute a temporary layoff either. Um, so it leaves open this question of, does it constitute constructive dismissal under the common law, which is a separate um, legal uh, scheme that sort of works in conjunction with everything else. So what is the liability? It's, we're, we're not really <laughs> honestly sure. And it really depends on, on the circumstances of the employees and the employer and what we, have been kind of advising is generally we hope that employees are not going to be bringing these kinds of claims um, because they want to keep their jobs and especially with the circumstances right now and how everything is very uncertain it's unlikely that employees are going to raise these as issues but it really will come down to right now what is practical in your office and in your office's circumstances too does it make sense if you haven't been paying your employees for a few months and they come back to work have they been receiving things like CERB that Justin mentioned? Can we top that up? Can we compensate them in some way for that time that was lost? And if it's uh, financially possible, then maybe that's something that you want to do because then you, you know, you're washing your hands of any liability in that case. Um, but that's not always feasible. So, great, Th thank you. So uh, let's circle back to Dale because I want to talk a little bit about managing investments as I know this is a question that's on a lot of people's minds. So, um, Dale, my portfolio has decreased a bit over the last few months. Should I sell? Should I buy? That's the question of the, uh, of the last quarter for sure. Um, so obviously, you know, disclaimer here, everyone should be looking out for their own advice. Everyone's got their own situation. So let's just kind of talk generally speaking here. Um, we've experienced a drop in March that we haven't seen since 2008. 2008 in its peak, the markets dropped 50%. And so in the peak of March, within like a, within a two week period of time, the markets dropped about 35%. It's one of the sharpest declines we've ever seen, you know, since, I, since I've been living or ever for that matter. Um, so the question of sell or buy more, now let's fast forward to where we are today. And now we've seen one of the fastest recoveries we've ever seen since inception in the last three, four months. Um, but we're not, we're not, at, we're not at equilibrium at this point. So the markets are still down, you know, depending on the sector, anywhere from five to 15%. There's still definitely an opportunity, but the individual really has to look to their own personal risk tolerance, to what their goals are, to what their time horizon is for their investments. If they can continue to put money away for a long period of time, when I say long period, I'm talking greater than five years, then now would be a great buying opportunity. But if we look at the markets now, they have never been more volatile than we've ever seen. We've seen markets go up 9% in one day and down 8% the next day. So if someone's putting money away that they're going to need uh, in the near future, whether it's for a down payment on a home or improvements in their practice, or they plan on hiring more employees when COVID gets better, whatever the reason may be, then I would not recommend doubling down on your position. So, so what are some of the investment strategies that could be used during a volatile market in reduced income? Particularly asset classes or anything? Yeah, so I mean, we have several clients who've taken, you know, who've taken a hit with their income and, um, we're kind of looking at the last six months and the next and the rest of the year, the next six months on, on where on where they stand. And for people whose income has significantly dropped, there are some unique opportunities. Um, one of them being, you know, so if some if you have previous capital gains on some of your on some of your uh, investment portfolio that you haven't triggered yet, you've had a profit on them, and now some of your stocks or investments have had a loss, then you could trigger a loss to offset those gains in this time. And then, you know, within a certain period of time, I think it's about one month or so, Justin can verify, but you can basically rebuy that position. So that's a unique opportunity to kind of lock in a loss, offset your gains and, and increase your overall position. Uh, another strategy would be, you know, many healthcare professionals that we deal with all have uh, a 
amazing lines of credits with the banks, whether that's personal or with the business, uh, rates at prime or prime minus 0.25. And so, you know, we don't generally encourage boring to invest at all. But in times like COVID, when things are tight and we're trying to get by and the interest rates are as low as they've ever been, you know, right now they're at basically 2.2% for many lines of credits. That's something that the, uh, the physician or the dentist, they can use in, a, in, a, you know, in this short period of time to whether it's you know, funding their lifestyle or needing funds for a practice. And if they're gonna borrow money to then invest back in their business, then that interest becomes tax deductible and which makes that, the cost of that borrowing really inexpensive and a great solution for the time being. Um, one of the last strategies I'll speak to, which is a simple one, but most people don't think about it. When the markets are really volatile, there's no such thing as timing the markets, right? If we all had crystal balls, we'd all, we would all be billionaires. And so when we're thinking about the future, especially in times like this, one of the best recommendations that we can give our clients and to anyone for that matter, is to not be putting huge lump sums of money into the market. So, you know, if you have savings of a hundred thousand or a million or half a million, whatever that may be, my recommendation would be, you know, tomorrow don't invest it, but instead take that sum of money and then spread it out over a period of time over the next six to 12 months. Maybe you're going to put money in every two weeks or every month. And that's a term called dollar cost averaging. And what you're doing is, you are, you know, you're diversifying your portfolio. You're reducing the volatility that you're going to be exposed to because we can't time when the market goes up, when the market goes down. So by doing so, you're basically going to guarantee that you will be able to buy in when the markets do have those drops, which are great opportunities for the long term. Thank you. So I know some of our listeners um, are approaching retirement and we had some questions around estate planning, uh, which some people might be considering. So, so Justin, how would you respond to some of these questions? So one is, should I sell earned losses? How do I do that if I want to buy the stock back? Oh, uh, thanks, Ivan. And before I get into that, I just actually wanted to mention very quickly, because we're in that time of the year sort of, uh, you know, uh, I'm sure everybody's been aware of all the tax deadline extensions. Um, normally taxes are due April 30th, but that, but this year payments for taxes and have been extended to September 1st. So, you know, if anybody is thinking that they're late, you know, the government has um, asked that you file your taxes if you're self-employed by June 15th, but they won't charge you penalties or interest if you paid up by September 1st. And there's been extensions for, for corporations as well. So I, I'm not going to go through all the different permutations, but uh, check on the CRA website or with your accountant for your extended tax deadline because everything has been pushed. With respect to uh, Ivan's question on, on estate planning, yeah, so you know, selling accrued losses, it, it could make sense, for example, like Dale said, if you had gains in the past three, three years, you want to recover some of that, that tax, right? You can only uh, go back three years uh, to, get that, to get those gains back. So selling losses is fine. You just have to wait 31 days to if you want to repurchase that position or else the loss is denied. So that's something to keep in mind if you're selling and then going to buy back that position. Um, one thing that's very important for those of you with corporations is something called the capital dividend account. Now I'm sure uh, some of you might have heard of it, but basically as we know in Canada, we'll see for how long, capital gains are taxed at 50%, 50%, percent five zero. Um, and so if you sell something for $100, $50 goes in your jeans. The other $50 goes on your tax return and is subject to tax. Corporations, of course, you know, they don't really exist, right? So in order to put the individual on the same footing, whether they earn it again personally or in their company, half of the gain is, goes on the corporate return, but the other half, the tax-free half, goes into the special account, the capital dividend account, and it can be paid out to you tax-free. The important thing to know regarding timing on the capital dividend account is, uh, let's say you have a $100 gain, so $50 goes into the capital dividend account, then you have a $100 loss. Well, that negative 50 also goes into the capital dividend account to make zero. So now you can pay out nothing tax-free. The strategy here is timing. The capital dividend account is a point in time test, meaning minute by minute, day by day. So if you want to sell something, if you have a gain stock and a loss stock, 
and you sell them, you sell the gain and the loss, okay? And you then pay out the capital dividend, there's not gonna be any there, it's gonna net to zero. What do you do? Relatively simple, uh, sell the gain stock, pay out that $50 of tax-free money, then the next day or whatever it is, after that, sell the loss stock. So make sure you time those transactions because it, it can result in a pretty big tax savings. So if you're looking to sell uh, uh, loser stocks and gain stocks, make sure you time them if you wanna take money out. Sell the gain, take out this capital dividend account, sell the loss stock. Um, now, so that's how to generally deal with loss, preg what we call pregnant or accrued loss uh, uh, positions in a declining market. <clears throat> with respect to estate planning, retirement planning, that kind of stuff, these kind of markets are actually, if they have any silver lining, are good for this type of thing. If, if any looking to implement freezes uh, or uh, or 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 uh, reverse an estate freeze, right? And a straight estate freeze is bringing in, you know, uh, shareholders into the company. Which, if you're a medical professional of a certain age, probably not going to be for me. But if you're looking at potentially retiring, and you're going to maybe deregister your um, your your corporation, and, and it'll just be an investment company, uh, you have to lock in the value of the company as it is today with you. It's only growth after that point that can accrue to the next generation. So, so if you're in a downward sort of environment, then you could freeze or lock in your value at a lower amount, meaning that the, any upgrowth, any increase in growth from that can go to the next generation. So you can take advantage of the low values right now. Similarly, if you've already done a freeze in the past, we can do something called a thaw. Right, the reverse of a freeze. So if you froze at something in the past and now basically the value of your company is lower, well, you can now reduce what you previously froze and start to pass that growth on to the next generation. So those are two uh, silver linings in a downward environment that people can take advantage of. Okay, great. So, so Dale, along with the estate planning, financial planning is also something people are, have been talking about. So if, how should I be allocating my monthly disposable income during COVID? Pay down debt or invest? That's a great question. Um, so, I mean, hopefully there's still, you know, a lot of people have taken a haircut on their, on their billings and their, and their revenue, but hopefully there's still some uh, not just for, you know, food on the table and business, but for some savings thereafter. And, you know, because we're working with medical students, residents, newly practicing physicians and dentists, and then all the way to the retirees, it's going to depend really where you are in that cycle. That's going to make the most sense. But basically, you know, when you're looking at your debt, you're trying to understand what's the cost of that debt. So like I was alluding to before, a lot of you have uh, lines of credit or loans at prime or prime minus 0.25. So in, in this environment right now, we're looking at 2.2%. Things dropped, they were you know 3.45% a few weeks ago. Market, uh, the government dropped the rates and now we're at 2.2. So when you're paying down your debt, there's two things to be mindful of. Number one, those, that's an after-tax return, right? And for most of the things we're talking about with investments, it's before tax. So taking the 2.2%, that's like a guaranteed GIC which is really good. No one's paying a 2.2% a GIC at the bank, at least not that I know of. Uh, so in the short term, that's going to be your best solution, especially when things are really volatile. But again, if the money you're going to be putting away, you can say to yourself, I don't need this for a short term expenditure. This is going to be for five, seven, 10 years in the future, then it would probably be a better opportunity for you to be investing that in the markets, given the environment. Okay. So um, I, we've had a question and that is that, so my, my billings are lower due to COVID. What do you think of increasing one's investment risk tolerance as a strategy in response to lower billings? So I've had this question, someone posed this question to me actually about three weeks ago and someone trying to increase their risk tolerance 
just for the purpose of gains is something I'm never going to, I'm going to always advise against that. People's risk tolerance, they generally don't change from day to day, whether it's COVID or not. Uh, so my advice would be for the healthcare professional to stick with their current risk tolerance. So whether that's, you know, that person's a balanced investor, whether it's 50% stocks and 50% bonds or 80% stocks and 20% bonds, whatever that is, they should be sticking with that because if you increase your risk tolerance, then you're going to be increasing your exposure to volatility and you're going to be increasing your exposure to negative returns. And so in this market of COVID, our kind of advice is to really, you know, hopefully you had a plan in place with your advisor, you know, five months ago before COVID happened. And the advice is to really to stick to that plan, to weather the storm, because, you know, an example, which I, which I give a lot the last few months is if we go back to 2008, when the markets dropped to 50%, people tend to panic sell. So when the markets drop and they're at their low, that's when people like to sell. When the markets are high, that's when they like to buy. And that's human behavior. And so, you know, the best way that we can help is to kind of encourage the opposite of that approach. And when the markets dropped 50% in 2008, if you left your money alone, 18 months later, you were even. So what does that mean? It means there's no real reason to change your risk tolerance in a short-term period of time. You should stay the course and, and think towards long-term. So, so Dale, what do you recommend in terms of uh, an emergency fund? And if someone doesn't have one, what is the best strategy for starting one, particularly during this time? So surprisingly, you know, an emergency fund is really financial planning 101. And it's, uh, it's something that everyone should have first and foremost before they start a TFSA, before they got RSP, RESP for the kids, corporate investments. It usually falls to the back burner. And unfortunately, it takes times like, like this where, you know, people have to dip into something, whether, you know, it's going to be an insurance policy that's going to help them or whether uh, billings have decreased and they got to get a supplement of income from somewhere. So if someone doesn't have one, I'm gonna recommend going forward, regardless of what the paycheck is, at a minimum, 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 they should be taking 10% away every single month, putting that into a guaranteed savings account and trying to build themselves three to six times their income. And so that's kind of the, you know, we can go, you can go 12 months, but that takes obviously a lot of time to build, but everyone's very simple basic goal should be, they should be setting aside three to six months of, of, of basically of the revenue that they're going to need. So um, I'm going to, any participants that have any questions, I'd really encourage you to put it through, through the chat. We've got about 10 minutes left. What I thought I'd do is ask um, our panelists if they have anything to add, starting with Kate, if there's any points you want to make that haven't yet been covered. Sure. Um, I just wanted to add a little bit to the question about um, liability for employees that are coming back to work from layoff or from a leave of absence and if they haven't been paid during that time. Because um, there is one strategy um, that employers can take and that is to ask the employees essentially to waive their right to bring a claim of constructive dismissal. And what that will look like is essentially an agreement with consideration. So what that means is it will cost you essentially, um, but that is a strategy to help reduce any kind of liability because if a claim does come through and it goes through the whole court process, that can be incredibly costly. So that might be a good option. Okay, great. J Justin? Yes. Any, any, any last thoughts or anything you wanna to add to what you've said? No, I would say, you know, uh, apply for those benefits. Um, if you're not sure, there, the 75% wage subsidy is, and the $40,000 SIBA loan are the two biggest ones, in my opinion. That $40,000 loan, I would imagine almost everybody here qualifies for. You'll get the money the next day, almost no questions asked. And uh, the one thing I want to mention on that is if you repay the loan by the end of 2022, it's interest-free, by the way. Uh, they forgive 25% uh, of it. So you end up only having to pay back 30,000 of the 40K. So, so we, just, we just got a question um, through the chat, and that is, is the CERB, CRB, applicable to registered healthcare professionals who are independent contractors? 
Yeah, it, you, you, it, it, it is. So, so the criteria, they define a, a worker as somebody who made $5,000 uh, uh, or more, at least $5,000 from employment income, self-employment income. But in order to go on the CERB, of course, you have to have, they use the word cease, you have to cease working. So, you know, whatever that means, right? But, you know, I, I guess it means no emails, no calls, nothing, but um, uh, yeah, you are, you are eligible. Okay. Dale, do you have anything um, that you want to say before we close? Just, I didn't get a chance to say in the beginning, just that, uh, you know, we are working with the healthcare professionals every day. And just uh, for those of you who are listening, just want to give you my utmost thanks and appreciation that uh, we're all very grateful for your, for your service and continued efforts every day to help in all of us Canadians. And, um, you know, if there's anything that we can do on our end to help you, we're happy to help. So if we don't, if we don't have any more questions coming in through the chat, um, I think we'll, we'll close. So I want to, thank um, our panelists for a very, very insightful conversation. I hope that everyone who joined us this evening found this helpful and educational. As a reminder, if you want to refer back or share this conversation with anyone, the recording of tonight's webinar will be emailed to all of you tomorrow, as well as will be available on jewishtoronto.com. As you may be aware, UJA has launched an emergency campaign for co community resilience to help our community through the tremendous challenges posed by COVID-19. If anyone is interested in learning more about the campaign or getting more involved with the healthcare division, I would be more than happy to speak with you. My email address is ivandiamond at rogers.com. I've put it into the chat as well. Lastly, I want to thank those of you who are frontline workers who joined us this evening. Thank you for working tirelessly to keep us all safe. Thanks again to everyone for joining us tonight. Stay healthy. Good night.